And hello, there it is, our really hip opening music theme, uh, graphics designed by my colleague um, Mario Badia, and some open license music from the Free Music Archive. And here I am already giving attributions, but first, what the heck's going on here? Uh, I'm Alan Levine, and we are live on the internet. Uh, this is part of a, an idea I had for Open Education Week, where just to have sort of a daily, twice a day show where we can talk about what's going on and a cat is walking in front of the camera, so just beware. Um, and the whole idea is, is not for me to talk about what's going on, but to bring people in who are going to just engage in informal conversation. And uh, if there are people in our vast YouTube audience who want to uh, send us questions, just send them through the chat, and we'll pass it on. But uh, enough of me. I, I, you know, I was going to talk about things that are coming up, but you can look at the schedule. Um, there, there's like three – I forget how many – uh, like 200 some different events going on. Um, if you go to oeweek.oeglobal.org, you go to the schedule, you can look by day. All the times uh, should be converted to your local time. So we try to make it easy. Although I managed to confuse some of my guests with my mal time convergence. Um, but anyhow, it's just a, a great honor to have uh, two colleagues in here that I'm going to uh, bring on screen and just uh, really great to have uh, Martin Weller um, from Cardiff, Wales. And Martin's a, an old blog friend. We've hung out together. I've visited and we've done a lot of projects over the years. And Florence Devois, who is coming to us, I believe, from Marseille. And um, and we're in different times. It's late in the evening for them. It's late in the afternoon for me. Um, according to Florence's schedule, it's kind of early in her workday because she works into the late hours, but um, just really great to, to be here. So uh, I'll just give a chance. Um, I'll pick on Martin first. Just, you know, tell us again where you are in the world. Um, you know, obviously you're in front of your books, um, but um, just uh, say a little bit about the work you do in open education as if people don't know who Martin Weller is. Sure. Thanks, Alan. Uh, yeah. So I'm Martin Weller. I work at the Open University in the UK. I've uh, been there for 28 years now, so uh, last month, my 28th anniversary. Um, I lead a project called uh, GoGN, the Global OER Graduate Network, which is funded by the Hewlett Foundation. That's in its 10th anniversary this year, which is a global network of uh, OER researchers. Maybe we'll talk about that later. Yeah, and I'm in beautiful Cardiff in Wales. Uh, we're due to get a light sprinkling of snow tomorrow, which uh, <laughs> I think compared to what Alan is receiving, <laughs> It's nothing, but we're all going into major panic in Britain. There's snow coming. It's the beast from the east. Everyone panic. So <laughs> that's what's happening here. Yeah. Well, we, we hope you survive yeah. the, the big blizzard because yeah, I, I think I've seen on Instagram you already have flowers here. So Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I don't want to lose those daffodils. Yeah, yeah but no, it, it's great to have you. And I really want to come back and um, talk about not only GoGN, but um, I want to talk about your books and especially about metaphor. So I can't wait to see yeah. that. But um, now we're going to go to Marseille um, to talk to Florence Dubois and, and I'm going to cut her off and say uh, that means homework in French. And so, yeah, uh, <laughs> does, do you get teased for that, that your name is homework? Uh, not so much, because guess what? When I was a young lady, I wasn't called Dubois before I got married. Ah. So children were not having fun about that. But the second teaser is my maiden name has a meaning as well. I'm not going to tell you. You can find out on the internet what it is. But it has a more embarrassing meaning than uh, homework. But yeah, I only have trouble in the shops when I have to spell my names and everybody write it the same way than homework. It's very weird, very embarrassing sometimes. Anyway, it's we are in Marseille. I am in Marseille. This is in France, south of France. Uh, it is a night right now. Same for Martin, I guess. And um, yeah, the, the place is great. And um, the first flowers showed up this weekend. I, I started to see the first roses. So it's a good sign that the spring is coming. Wonderful. So um, let me just briefly explain who I am. Um, I've been a Wikipedian for 20 years, so it's a very long time. I joined Wikipedia when uh, the project existed for about a year. So it would be quite complicated to explain all of what I've been doing on Wikipedia for the past 10 years. But uh, I'm still a volunteer over there, and I'm also working in that sector. So very briefly, I work in part in a South African 
organization called Wiki in Africa. And we can talk further afterwards of uh, what I do in that association. And I'm also known as the Wikipedian in residence for WIPO, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization. Excellent. And uh, so, I mean, there's lots of things we can talk about We and we have talked about before, but um, mm -hmm. uh, like it's hard to imagine when Wikipedia was kind of new and novel and there was all <laughs> this, you know, really, can we create an encyclopedia on the internet? And to think of where it has come is just, it's like one of the things when I get depressed about how things are going, I was mm -hmm. like, thankfully we have this. We have this. It's a dinosaur project now. It's still weird to, for me to think about it. It's a dinosaur pro project. Yeah. But yeah, thank God it's there. Yeah. And uh, how do I get to know Open Education Global? I think it was already huh, maybe four or five years from now. I joined uh, some of the conference, in particular the one in France that took mm -hmm. place a year ago. And uh, otherwise, online event, online activities. I presented several times on projects in the past. And I think I joined the Open Education Week last year with a couple of things as well. So, yeah, it's I'm not completely new around, but that's it. Right. So I just want to ask, like, um, uh, Martin, you probably have known about Open Education Week um, for a long time. Um, like, uh, what do you, what's on your schedule for this week? Or what are you looking uh, to be part of or to do? Uh, well, actually, I'm going to be honest, there isn't a lot on my schedule this week for Open Education Week, because I'm going to visit my daughter uh, in America on Wednesday. So that's my main plans for this week. Uh, but I think that, uh, a few of the GoGM people are presenting on your shows, Alan. So that's... Uh, that should be good. I'm not sure the office is coming in. I think maybe back and some of the others, the, the GoGM members. Um, and uh, probably the main thing we've got, not so much that's going to be going this week, but we are partnering um, with Alton. I know you had Mariner earlier to uh, run OER 23 with the people up in Inverness, uh, with UHI up in Inverness. And that's uh, in April. So we've been work working towards that and making sure. So we're going to bring about 15 uh, of our GoGM members to Inverness from all around the world. So we're busy organising that. It's one of those things that uh, takes always takes far longer than you think it's going to take, trying to organise flights and accommodation and work and stuff. So we're busy doing that. That's going to sort of nose to the grindstone stuff to come and get that organised. But, yeah, we're really, really excited about that. So for, we did a bit last year for the OER conference in London. We got about nine people together. That was the first time back since COVID. But this is our first big one, so I'm really excited about that. Yeah, and um, I'm on the conference committee, and and cool. I've heard that they're even the interest uh, for coming to, in person exceeded what they would thought. Yeah, so right. again, there's this desire again to. Um, yeah, it, it was funny that last year it was you know you sort of forget already now. I've, you kind of forget what happened in lockdowns. So did we really do through that? But this time last year it was really kind of people were really very tentative that first meeting like in April, you know, in 2022. You know, it's still. For a lot of people, it was the first time back. It was my first conference back. And it was quite an emotional feeling, I think, that first time sort of meeting people again. Um, yeah, so th this year, I think people are more up for it and there's kind of a, a bigger audience coming. So it should be exciting. Excellent. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to that. I will, um, uh, I'll flip over to, to Florence. Um, are you, are you, you're part of some things going on this week or, um, and there are big things going on that you want to talk about too, I know, with your Wiki and Africa yeah. project. So, uh, yeah, so I must be honest, today I didn't have the time to join anything because last week was a super, super busy day for a week for me because we launched three projects. So uh, I'm just, you know, piling the last elements of this project, but I will have more time in the next few days. I saw already that there was a, a show planned, I think it's on Friday, to talk about Kiwix and about um, uh, Wikipedia in the classrooms. Uh, and I definitely will be there. I really would like to. Uh, I don't remember. I, it, I know it's it's run by Bukola James, Bucky. Uh, and I saw that there was Mahabali on it. So I really want to be there. But otherwise, I remember last year, uh, last year I attended mostly presentation about H5P or mm. HP5. Yeah. Um, and I spent the entire year thinking I need to test more and I need to do a project with it. And now I have the right elements to start. Guess what? One year later, I'm still there. <laughs> so it's still on my to-do list. 
So I know that if there is anything that somehow relates to this, I will come again and, and watch them. Yes, attend that. Oh, well, when, when you say H, I love HIP and um, no. I certainly like seeing interest. I mean, to me, it encapsulates so much of what OER should be. Uh -huh. um, and uh, definitely been seeing uh, a lot, you know, a continue growing interest um, uh -huh. in it. Uh, I, I have the same way. I, I want to do something with Wikidata. I took the Institute and I, I understand it, but then I got overwhelmed with how complex you know, and, and I know the part it of is. defining something, but I, I really think there is something um, that could be designed, you know, perhaps through OE Global or some other group to just have some people do some simple things, which is just adding information that they know in that structured format. Um, and, you know, the, mm. the, the benefit to me is like, you see the impact right away, like mm. taking on editing an article is like a bit of a monolith. But like Wikidata is just like just a little stone that you can kick around. Yeah, we, um, yeah there are different approaches to it. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say just that for uh, GoGen a couple of years ago, we worked with um, some people in America who ran a, a training session for GoGen people to sign up for. And again, it was partly because the Hewlett Foundation really wanted to get um, the OER pages in Wikipedia kind of updated. And, and we sort of brought in a few people, and then we repeated it last year. And that's been really good that, that learning those not not the not so much the data but learning those editing skills and and they've they edited some existing pages but also went off and created a lot of other pages you know around some uh, oer open education and social justice those kind of things so i think it's been a really useful kind of bringing together those two things but also i think it's a really kind of valuable skill and once those people having that training that kind of almost formal training was really useful for them that they've sort of then gone off to teach others how to do it as well so yeah, i think it's probably Good. It's always been a shame that the, the OER pages on Wikipedia weren't very good. <laughs> they should be the one area that's really good. So, you know, it's been a really useful thing to do to kind of update those. I think. Yeah. Oh, I know. And and I, I think Florence posted something in our Connect Community Space trying to say, like, let's take uh -huh. on some of these challenges. Yeah, yeah. And, and I was like, yeah, yeah, let's. And then, you know, we all got busy or something. And, and at the same time, uh, it's, uh, when, when we do that, there is conflict of interest. So, so it's complicated to talk about things we actually know well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because, yeah, we are biased, naturally. So, it should, yeah, it's a complicated thing. Yeah. Do, do you want to share some about, you, you mentioned the three campaigns. I'm, I'm really interested to know about um, yeah, the, three campaigns. The, yeah. the Wiki in Africa programs, especially. Yeah. So the first I could mention is actually in relation to Wikidata. So uh, I think it's a, it's a good way to mention it. So very few people actually really understand and know Wikidata and what it is useful for. But essentially, it's, it's structured data about something. And um, what we have been trying to do on, uh, in our ecosystem is to make sure that the images that are uploaded in our system on Wikimedia Commons platform get properly described and not only described by a big description in a certain language, but also get described by um, keywords, by key elements, in particular elements that are structured data, because at the end of the day, if you want to describe an image, I don't know about a tree, you only need normally to target tree in one language. And then normally it should be automatically understandable in any other single language. And most of the images on Commons are not this way. So a few years ago, the, the Wikimedia commu uh, Commons community decided to tackle this issue and to try to set up a system so that we could actually better describe in a structured way all the images. And that got me thinking. And we created um, a little tool, which is called Easer Tool. I thought, I, I think I, I gave you the link to give you an example. Yep. But what it does, it's a, it's a super simple tool that you can use on your computer or on your cell phone when you're uh, anywhere waiting in a maybe waiting at the doctor's or just on in the transportation system. You can go there and you tackle a topic, a category of things and uh, through a campaign, and you will improve the description of all the images. So the system will serve you images in a certain categories, and all you have to do is enter better description, caption, and keywords that we call depict. But essentially, that's keywords. And uh, every couple of months, we run a new campaign, 
And since this is March, and in March, it's important to talk about women, women's rights, um, we decided to do a special one related to all these activist women involved in fighting the climate, the impact of climate change. Um, so we, we called it, um, with this, this, this is a, I don't see uh, <laughs> the info you saw. Maybe, I, do, I don't know if you can share the screen yep. so that we see, we can see the this campaign, but the women activists. Yep. I'm so we started it. it already, well, six days ago. It was started on the 1st of March and we already collected over 2000 contribution on these images. Oh, cool. So there you go. This is the tour. So women on the front line climate It's complicated for me in English. And you see, we have at the moment already 2,700 2, contribution on, on less than 2,000 images. So these images will include women or um, uh, events like um, strikes or a political statement being done by women related in relation to climate. And it's, that's a, an easy way to contribute to Wikipedia without having to get bothered into uh, all the rules, all the code, mm -hmm. something you can, it's an easygoing project. So yeah, um, that was, that's my first one. And I must say that currently on Wikipedia, there are other campaigns related to gender gaps. So do not hesitate to have a look at what is currently proposed. This is one of several uh, campaigns. Right. And then and there you, are two you, other ones. You yeah. got me you got me interested in December. I, I joined in uh, late to the, the She Said campaign, which is yeah. editing wiki quote and, and I, yeah. I, I got a little bit of a start, but I, I love these approaches. Yeah, so <laughs> the fact is we are trying to work on other projects than Wikipedia itself, so that we explore yeah. different paths, different directions. Wiki quotes is about quotes from notable women on various topics or quotes about women. Uh, so that's one of the projects we run every single year at the end of the year, uh, at the end of the year. And we got excellent results this year as well. So yeah, that's our second big direction. The third big direction we have is we do a lot of mentorship uh, for African women to try to understand better how the Wikimedia ecosystem work and so that they can get more involved and in particular, get empowered to become leaders of communities and uh, get uh, empowered to run activities on their own, to build projects, build um, programs that could actually change things because we are a very male world. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's yeah. one. And I um, wanted to mention two others, completely different ones. So we have a, a project running for two months, March, April, which is called Wiki Loves Africa. It's a photo campaign. Uh, we have been running it for eight years now. So we are on the ninth year. And do you know, Alan, what's the topic this year? Every year we have a different uh, topic. What is the topic? You know, this I, year? I, oh, it's a quiz. And I, I know I saw it. And I'm, I'm going to have you to. You saw some info and, somewhere. And, and look at it. Um, uh, I don't know. Come on. <laughs> Climate and weather. Climate, Climate and, and weather. weather. Well, yeah. we were just talking about weather. And yeah, we were talking about weather. Yeah. So uh, the idea is very simple. We ask African people to, to participate to it, to collect pictures in, in relationship to weather and, and uh, climate. So as to populate the database, the Wikimedia database with images, with videos, with audios and graphics as well, represent uh, graphical representations. And the idea is also to illustrate Wikipedia articles. So that's the theme for this year. Um, this is promoted on the side notice banner for everyone living in Africa. And this is also on the main page of comments. So you cannot miss it. If you go to Wikimedia Commons, you will find the contest. It runs very well. I'm beginning to think that it's probably one of the perhaps the largest photo contest in Africa uh, at the moment. Big participation from local communities and an opportunity for every group or every individuals to join the fund and to learn at the same time, to collaborate with others and, and feel better uh, in the Wikimedia world by contributing this way. 
So okay. we're trying to find to fill some gaps there. Okay. So that's uh, the second fun one. Now I could click in, but uh, who or who is Wangari Matai? Ah, Wangari Matai. This is a woman. She uh, got the Nobel Prize in relation to her activity in fighting the climate change. Uh, so oh. uh, this is a special day, the uh, African Environment Day and Wangari Matai Day is actually on March 3rd. And it celebrates all the things that are being done around climate environment in Africa. Excellent. Yeah. And so that's linked to my third project. Okay. I'm and the link. third project is, is called, the... it's not a very fancy name, I must say, but it's called Africa Environment. And this is a brand new project. We have never run it. That's something new. So the first one was about data. The second one was about images. And the third one, Martin, what do you think it is about? <laughs> uh, video. No, no, the second <laughs> include, no, no, the second include video. It's images, uh, audio, text. graphics. The third one is about text. It's about Wikipedia articles. Yeah. Uh, and we came from, we noticed something. When you go to the English Wikipedia and you look at the the article written about a country, let's say UK, you do have a dedicated article about climate in UK. So you can talk about all this fascinating topic around weather, because I know this is something important for UK people. So you can talk about the weather, you can talk about the climate, and there's also an article about the impact of climate change in UK. So all the problems we are all seeing right now uh, for us, it's mostly fires. For others, it's flood. There are many different impacts. And there is a dedicated article related to climate change in France, climate change in UK, climate change in Canada, climate change in the USA. All of this is covered. But when it comes to Africa, only three countries amongst all the African country, the continent have an article about climate. So if you look for an article about climate in Togo or climate in Benin or climate in Rwanda, you do not have an article at all. It's just nothing. So we thought, let's try to work on this and let's try to have, you're not showing me this, the right. Um, I was worried right, about that. <laughs> yeah, it's not the right one. It's the um, African environment. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. So... The Wikimedia Foundation, the host of Wikipedia, teamed with African Union, and they decided to have a special, a special project related to African environment in Africa, uh, writing on articles to try to fill the gaps. And we had the chance to be awarded the implementation of this project. So this started last week, last Friday. It's completely brand new. And uh, we have the opportunity to fund 17 groups to work on that project, to fill up some text about Nigeria, about Ghana, about Togo, about Rwanda, and so on. Malawi, Zimbabwe, 17 groups all together will work on this topic. So we'll write articles. And now why do I mention it, aside from the fact it's a very cool project and I love it and I work on it, is that absolutely everyone can contribute to that. It's not, it's not restricted to these 17 um, groups. Everyone can contribute either by writing or by providing sources, by providing information. Maybe, Martin, you are aware of some interesting sources that we could use and you can then come to me and I, we will mm -hmm. add them in the resource section. Yeah. And of course, since we are all in the open knowledge uh, sphere, it would be awesome if this knowledge, this source of information were under a free license. But unfortunately, we know it's not always the case. So, Absolutely. So, yeah. so what's, what's the, um, what makes it one of these campaigns successful? What does it take to get that level of activity? Lots of talk around um, first. Uh, publicity, uh, visibility of the program definitely is a, is a plus. 
but also all the groups locally that really, really want to make a difference. Um, many of them are brand new to Wikipedia or, you know, only one year old. They don't have a lot of experience. So it's fascinating because they have lots of new ideas, lots of inspiration. But we need to also help them on the path because otherwise they will full, fully face, you know, the, the dinosaur editors who are not always very welcoming. <laughs> so we have to, to try to help uh, the collaboration uh, and the addition of these groups. But um, yeah, that, that will work. I'm confident. And the idea behind this is to make it something renewable uh, in both sense. Renewable because the content produced will be reusable by anyone and renewable because we hope to do it again next year. So whatever is built this year will be useful next year in the reiteration of that project. Fantastic. And, uh, and definitely, you know, I want to try to do anything we can to help and, and rope some people into to participating because there's, like you say, there's so much yeah. everybody can do. Yeah. yeah. Every person interested in climate change, typically, or every scholar who has access to some, some info, interesting information can, can jump in. Uh, it's not about necessarily writing a full complicated very meaty article it's it's starting from nothing and getting somewhere so uh, anyone from anywhere can actually help it and of course it's not in english only i forgot to mention that so uh about one third of our groups will be french speaking and basically nearly all the 17 group want to also work in their local language so some will be working in swahili some will be in, in hebo there's uh um, at least, yeah, more than half of them have a local language in mind and will work at the same time either in English, French or in their local and in their local language. So it, it's going to be super interesting, I think. It definitely is. And thank you for sharing all that. And yeah. uh, I want to come back and look at those. <coughs> I love those campaign tools. Um, I, I, I like those um, ways you've done to try, to try and lower the threshold. For participation, so yeah, often exactly an yeah. of Wikipedia articles is both a technical issue, but mainly a process issue. And you mentioned the kind of dinosaur yeah. editors, you know, and I think people just yeah. get buffed very quickly. So anything you do to kind exactly. of lower that threshold of participation is really significant. Yeah, there, really there is that, and there is something as well uh, that is a bit weird for us. Uh, well, you're in Canada, I guess, Alan. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Uh, for Canadian, UK, France, we have many editors. So it's, it's normally quite easy to find a way to grab somebody with experience and, and can help. Mm. We actually have uh, chapters in Canada. We have a chapter in UK. We have a chapter in France. They can help. And the problem for these teams is that usually there are only a handful and all of them are brand new. Mm. And if they wanted to build up an entire um, project initiative on their own, then they need skills um, for social media and they need tech skills and they need uh, legal skills and they need so many skills and there are maybe a handful. So the idea behind this project is also to provide a sort of um, global initiative to which they can attach themselves and then they can focus on doing what they want to do. Uh, even if it's a small part, it will be great. It will be useful and they do not have to care about all the part to get there. So that's the idea behind what we are trying to do at Wiki in Africa is, is trying to build a, a global ecosystem for, for the African continent. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to get a chance too, to, to hear from Martin about, well, I follow what you do, but I think other people should know. Um, and, and I don't know. I want to talk about sharks. Why is there a shark on your blog? Okay. So <laughs> there's a long and a short answer. So I wrote a book called Metaphors of EdTech, um, which is published by Athabasca University Press. So open access, open license, and free to download. Uh, and it takes a number of different metaphors of education technology. Um, and one of which is about the film Jaws and the online pivot during the pandemic. Um, and that's partly just because I'm a big Jaws fan, so I just wanted to make sure I got it in there. And then when I was um, 
thinking about the cover, I worked with Brian Mathers, who um, we do a lot of work with. So uh, if ever you've seen any, any of the GoGN graphics, there's the all the penguins and stuff come from Brian. Uh, and we so I asked him to do a cover for the book, and he came up with a number of different sketches um, uh, related to different metaphors. Uh, I thank you, Alan, for putting the screen. Yeah, uh, and we, I liked all of them. They're all good. You know, rules of a creative process. And so I said, which one do you think is best? Why don't you just go for the one you like the most? And I thought, here's my chance to have a, a Jaws type cover on the book that I've written. Uh, and so I took it. But I think also you can, there is quite a lot of metaphor you can think about. Like, what does the shark represent in this metaphors of a tech? Is it the technology? Or whatever? You know, what, what do the people on the boat represent? So uh, you can apply that. And also, I think it's quite a nice, it stands out enough kind of on, the, on your social medias and stuff together for make it recognizable. So, oh, that's a fantastic that's the shark thing. I, I, you can't see here, but I've got the original Jaws poster up there next to me and the metaphors of EdTech poster up there. My walls. Absolutely. And actually, I I think I remember I went to the theater to see the premiere of Jaws. And, cool. And it's mm. it scared the the scra- <laughs> the bleep <laughs> out of me because we are going we are going the next weekend for a trip to the beach. <laughs> oh wow! Okay. I'm not going in swimming. <laughs> it's a very metaphorical film. You know? <laughs> well, it is like think about the reaction to artificial intelligence right now. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a sure. big shark, and yeah, yeah. Uh, we're on that boat trying to figure out what are we going to like what kind of chum it, are we going to throw over? It was interesting in the pandemic. You know, it's like lots of universities and uh, governments have tried to stay open and and uh, even at the time people were saying that they're just like the mayor in jaws was saying like those beaches will be open on the yeah. 4th of july you know so i can you know how that ended you know. yeah so and, and what else is kind of piquing your interest these days and um what, what kinds of curious yeah so um we were just chatting before we came in here uh, so i've just started podcasting uh metaphors of edtech podcast um and I know I'm very late to this game, you know. Uh, but I think it's just interesting with podcasting. I think there was, I don't know if we're in the second or third wave of it, you know, I remember when it's you know, in the mid 2000s and people started playing with it, it seemed, you know, interesting, but I didn't get into it. And I've just been amazed by how popular it's become uh, over the past sort of like five, 10 years, I think, all the, all the true crime podcasts and stuff. You know, I, I'm a big audiobook fan, so I don't actually listen to that many podcasts. I think there's only so many. So many things you can listen to, and I like listening to audio books. So, but um, you know, lots of people I know kind of just listen to podcasts on the go all the time. Uh, and I think the tools have really become so much easier with that. So I, I used Anchor, which I know the, the evil Spotify version of it, but it's a really easy tool to use. You know, it's like really simplistic. You know, I'm sure if you're doing really professional podcasts, you know, it's not sophisticated enough. But it, it, you know, it works really easily. You can publish all the different platforms. Boom, you're done. You know, it provides you with sounds for like transitions, what kind of stuff. I think just the ease of producing them. It's interesting. Um, I write on the, uh, I'm part of the team, so at the Open University in, in the Institute of Education Technology, where I uh, live, we, um, where I work, we have uh, this thing called the Innovating Pedagogy Report, which we produce every year, and it sort of lists 10 different pedagogies uh, we think are interesting. Um, and this year, one of the ones we're writing about is um, the pedagogy of podcasts. And uh, I was talking to one of the people writing with today, and she was saying like how uh, she's in South Africa, so how students there really started to demand podcasts. They don't want to sit at a computer and have video, like someone talking. Actually, they can. They'd much rather have a podcast. They can be doing other things at the same time. It's that kind of partial attention. So I think you know, it's really, in the same way that you know, I listen to audio books while I'm walking the dogs, and I think students really like the podcast um, format. And I think a lot of that increased during the pandemic as well. You know, when, when everyone was forced to go online, actually, you know, podcasts or audio, you know, and it, and often, unless the, the lecturer is really presenting something that you need the kind of visual representation of, you know, a podcast works really well. So I think that's that's kind of uh, piquing my interest at the moment, enjoying playing with that. Um, yeah, oh, I and no, I remember I was uh, talking to. Uh, um... A uh, professor in California who, instead of doing a, um, an open textbook, he did his as um, he, he basically did it as a podcast. Yeah. Um, because and his students said, you know, a lot of students because he's in the Los Angeles area. I mean, they have to drive forty five minutes. Yeah. Just absolutely. to get to class, and and, yeah, and yeah, to yeah. me, like yeah. that that's a beautiful way to um, 
you know, get some content that you can do while you're doing other things, so which has always been. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the sort of inspiration for me finally getting into it was my previous book, 25 Years of EdTech, um, also at Athabasca Press, uh, uh, Clint Alond, uh, fellow Canadian. Um, I thought it would be a good idea to create an audio book version. And he put in so much work, sort of rounded up different people to read each chapter. And then Laura Pasquini said, why don't we do a podcast for each chapter as well? Uh, and she you know, organised all that and got different people to come in and speak each week about the chapter. And obviously it's an excellent book. But actually, I think that audio book and podcast is more interesting than the book in a way. It's that people having that conversation around the, the, the source is actually the really interesting thing. And hearing other people's reflections on things that I've missed in the book or you know, their experience of what I was talking about. I think you did a version, didn't you, Andy? Did you do an audio book? Or, uh, I, I did. I was on the show with Laura. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, I think we were talking about bulletin board systems. Like, hearing other people's experiences about that stuff makes it a really rich resource then. And I think you, know, you can see how that would work with students, getting them to be co-creators you know, of podcasts and stuff. So I think that's, that's really exciting. And I think, um, you know, when you mentioned... Um, people looking at the pedagogy of, of podcast, I'd, I'd really be, I mean, I, I'm, I, I know people have probably like spent time trying to study that and, and make, come up with ideas, but just like what makes for a good learning experience um, mm. when you, um, you know, are, are in audio. And, and I've always, to me, like creating with audio offers a real opportunity because your, your um, audio has to sort of set the scene and then the person listening it's not as literal as video. And so yeah, they true. they construct the meaning as they're listening. And, and I think it's such a, a rich uh, possibility for thinking about learning content um, uh, because video is easy to do. I mean, you point yeah. a camera at something and you shoot it, but good audio mm. takes some skills to produce. I would jump in. I would jump in here to say that the only pr I I'm a big fan of podcasts. I, I uh, listen probably two hours a week uh, a day podcast when I'm driving, when I'm uh, yeah. at the gym and so on. But there is one thing that we're missing compared to the uh, the video format is the translation or at least hmm. the subtitling. Hmm. So yeah. for me, I can actually actively listen to English and French podcasts, and there is so much more variety in the English one. For the news, way more opportunities. For education, way more opportunities than in French. And uh, that's the only reason why I'm a little bit missing things when uh, so many people turn away from video and, and instead choose podcasts because I know many people cannot listen to them. It's yeah. too complicated. Yeah. But it's so rich. It's so rich. It gives so many opportunities. We actually, we, we ran a podcast last year. Uh, it's called Inspiring Open. We got 16 women, uh, African mm. leaders interviewed. Uh, that was our first one. <laughs> that was not simple, <laughs> I must say. <laughs> so, uh, Martin, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to read your blogs for ideas. <laughs> <laughs> that was challenging. I thought it was really to, to make something uh, professional, to make something really good and uh, quality. Uh, that's quite a lot of work, actually. Yeah, and I've, I've, I've seen I've, I've several... set the threshold yeah. low. For, so, so yeah, but, uh, <laughs> it depends how professional you want to be. You know, so. Yeah, but uh, now, OK, we are not professional, but, you know, good enough. And yeah. I've noticed that since the pandemics, there was many Wikipedians who decided to run a podcast. So okay. we have now quite a few podcasts of very different formats. And some of them are absolutely wonderful, and some mm -hmm. of them are just, uh, oh, right, not much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because it seems to be simple, but actually it's not. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's more than just clicking record. There's a lot to take, really? to, take to do that. But yeah, the, I love the podcast that you did for um, the uh, Wikilows women. They were, they were uh, really well produced, and I understand uh, what it takes. As I'm looking at, I have podcasts I recorded more than a month ago that I, I yeah. need to to get in but maybe i mean to me one of the places where this ai technology has come into play has been in the transcription oh yeah, um, yeah. and, and uh, i'm using a, a new tool called descript um okay. where it does the transcript but you can edit the the audio by editing the text so you take out all of the ums and things like that and yeah. it's kind of changing the way i'm going about my audio editing because wow. um 
I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of, I get overly precise about trying to get the sound per not only perfect, but um, taking out things I don't want to be in the final production. Um, so, yeah. um, and, and I, I've seen some things where the translation capabilities um, are, are quite amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's really come on, isn't it, the past few years? But, you know. Lots of good stuff. Yeah, transcription first, translation second. Uh, it's often complicated for us because of the jargon. <laughs> the jargon mm, doesn't go yeah. through so well, so it's, yeah. it still requires a lot of editing afterwards. Mm, but yeah, right. for news, it's great. For news, it's 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 uh, definitely a tool that can be used. And um, are, are you? Um, do you teach anymore, Martin? Do you, are you involved in some of the master's yeah. programs still? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we've um, so the yeah, university is, is all distance education, so we don't have you know, classes um, and most of our students are part-time but uh, where I work in the in, in IT we've got a master's in uh, online teaching that's uh, just being launched um, so that's really exciting I think you know the, during that it's interesting during the pandemic you know uh, lots of people came to the Open University sort of saying that we need to shift online you know tell us how to do this online learning stuff you know and so and we had uh, some some MOOCs or open courses, and we had we had some micro credentials people would take. But I think you know, bundling that up now into kind of more formal offering of a master's now, I think there's kind of a big big need for that. And and it's great, you know, Commonwealth of Learning are sponsoring um, some some scholarships to study on that as well. So yeah, that, that's all coming together. So yeah, I think you know that's it, it's interesting to kind of be in that space now. You know, it's like a, a, you remember when during the pandemic it suddenly felt like you know all these people have been trying to get people to talk to them about online learning suddenly their phones were like ringing off the hook you know, tell me how to do this stuff you know it's like an emergency service kind of thing so i think it's kind of interesting but it's also interesting that kind of now we've gone back to some element of face-to-face -face teaching the kind of backlash against much that online i don't know if you've seen this in france florence but certainly in the uk there's been all these kind of headlines about universities must go back to face-to-face, -to -face. you know, we're going to punish them if they're doing online learning, as if it's some kind of, like, harm that we're doing to people, rather than <laughs> it kind of saved education during during the pandemic, you know, so it's quite yeah. interesting. Yeah. I, I still have a, a daughter who is a student. Yeah, <laughs> she has been coupling quite yeah. a lot with the situation, and my husband uh, actually is a university professor, okay. so it's an ongoing conversation at home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it almost, in some ways, it makes you wonder about, like, what have we learned? Because, I mean, we're going back to something that doesn't exist. And, yeah. like, what we did wasn't exactly the best way. And so, I mean, what's what's the new direction? Will we create one? Um, well, I, th I think I think openness does, to, to bless bring us back onto track, there, there, is, there is a role for openness in that, I think. You know, it's like, you know, it was interesting, we saw the kind of, Price hike around open tech uh, around textbooks, e textbooks mm -hmm. during the pandemic, you know, and then the, the SOS textbook um, campaign, you know, to kind of move to openness. But also, I just think increasingly it's difficult. I think one of the problems that campus based universities have is you're trying to operate dual systems simultaneously. So people want the face to face, then you've probably seen all these Twitter threads about, you know, lecturers turning up to, to lecture halls and just being no students there whatsoever. And they can't move fully online because they've still got this campus and they're trying to run that. And so trying to operate that hybrid model could be you know, there's kind of different economies to both of those things for a start. You know, and I think I wonder if, you know, I know, I think every five years or so, um, the people in the OER, OER world say, our time has come. You know? <laughs> but I think there is a kind of a, 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 a moment here, you know, it's like if you need to make some of that shift to online learning, but you're still operating the campus model, you can't put in the, the the time it takes to produce that high quality distance education material you know, like we do at the Open University. Yeah. So o OER provides you at least a kind of a, a midway point. You know, you can take that out, you can take that content and just reuse it. You know, and wrap around. Yeah. And I was so it felt that we didn't it didn't make a big difference, but I experienced one year once. Uh, last fall, one conference organized in the Wikimedia sphere that was face-to-face um, uh, -face and online at the same mm -hmm. time. And I was completely amazed by what they did. Mm. It did required a lot of technology, a lot of uh, human work before, 
but they really managed to do something where you felt, really felt that the people online were with you and uh, yeah. on equal standing that the people in the room. That, that's the only case I could see that work uh, for maybe around 100 people at most. That was great. Otherwise, we are slowly, slowly reverting to the old model. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's strange. I think the the OER um, by Domains Twenty One conference that happened during that lockdown was a really good example of that. So you know, uh, Jim Groom and Lauren and the team at Reclaim worked with Marin and the team at Alt, and that really felt like you know you were capturing that spirit of you know, an online conference being different and i think you know just the use of the stream yard and like, you are here and uh, discord mm -hmm. and those kind of things it really sort of felt like it, it operated differently you know, like a proper online conference rather than just the the the, the lecture deficit model which we kind of had generally you know, people just streaming talks you know, and stuff. yeah that was the yeah that was one of the favorites i saw during that time so um uh, last thing, maybe, what do you think a year from now when I call up you both, what are we going to be talking about? Hmm. We'll be I will present you my H5P project. Yes. <laughs> Good idea. I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we'll and it has to, you have to try the branching scenario. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I know. Yeah, that's the uh, you certainly know about this this uh, scenario about um, a woman trying to uh, to fight uh, violence, human violence of a woman at mm. home with her husband, yeah. and this this person. And when I saw that presentation, I was, oh my god, this is so awesome, and I want to do something similar. But I can't yeah. imagine the amount of work that must have been required. That Don't start with a, that one, believe me. It's a, that is probably, <laughs> branching scenario is really amazing. Really well, amazing. I, yeah. I, I have to say, I, I love H5P, and you can see why people get interested. But when you get into and start making it, you find there's a lot of little subtle things that, that yeah. catch you by surprise. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, of what it does for making something reusable and um, attaching um, the metadata yeah. and attribution for all the parts and um, uh -huh. and and the, the localization of, of language or being able to change the interface, there's so many good things about H5P. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my exploration for last year and next year. <clears throat> okay. Well, you know where to find me. Yeah, I, I know where. I, I, I've, I've <laughs> wanted to try to get some people together to work on some H5P. Um, but yeah, it's, it's actually a little bit harder to do um, over the uh, asynchronous space. Yeah. I think we'll be saying what a great OE Global conference we had in Edmonton. <laughs> it's been in, in, uh, I'm looking forward to that. Especially. Yeah, that, absolutely. That that yeah. will be one that I can get to without an airplane. So. That's right. Yeah, cool. <laughs> you can see that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, I um, I really appreciate you both taking time um, late in the night and and dealing with my my schedule snafus, but. Um, this is the kind of thing you know. I really wanted to do is just have informal conversations with interesting people. It's been great to meet you, Florence. Yep. Let's catch up again, Alan. Yep. I'm Definitely. going to read on your blog now. <laughs> well, I, I, I may well be in touch actually when we come to do the uh, so we do this um, thing with the GoGen network every year about you know updating OER pages. So uh, I, I might well be in touch with you. That'd be great. Sure. Awesome. All right. All right. Well, have a great evening. I'm going to play the exit music so yep. uh, the video can be complete. Um, and just thanks again for being part of this and have a great rest of the week. Thanks, Thank Alan. you for having us. Thank you, Alan. Thank you.